Hey guys, thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. We hope that through this message, God speaks to you and that he challenges you to grow and develop in your faith. We hope you'll stop by our website as well, trinitynwa.com. We'll see you soon. Well, I want you to uh, grab your Bible. I want you to turn to 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 12. How many of y'all are feeling great and jittery this morning? Are you, did you have your coffee? Everybody have your coffee? I just saw, uh, uh, I've seen it before, but I was sitting deck in the back there waiting for them to tell me to come out at the wrong time. And, uh, and I looked at a sign that's back there in the, in the choir room. There's this, uh, oh, a piece of furniture, and there's some coffee sitting there, and then there's this sign next to the sign, or there's a sign next to the coffee pot there of this girl, and it looks like it's from the 50s. You know, it's an old sign, and she's got a big smile on her face. She's holding a cup of coffee, and it says, drink more coffee. Ready for this? Do stupid things faster and with more energy. And then it hit me. That's what's wrong with some of these people. You're drinking too much coffee. Settle down. Drink a Mountain Dew. <laughs> Amen? Not that that's going to be less caffeine, but Mountain Dew is better than coffee. I don't care what you say. My kids are always trying to get me to drink coffee. They say, Heather, she says, Dad, I think you would like coffee if, we, if you had the kind we drink with ice cream and everything. And I'm like, give me the ice cream, but don't ruin it with the coffee. I mean, I'll take the ice cream. You could tell I'm not a coffee drinker. But I'm not making fun of those of you who do. I am a Mountain Dew drinker, though, from time to time. So, man. And I'm not against caffeine. <clears throat> uh, don't think you're going to go to hell for it, but I believe we should do everything in moderation. So some of, you sh some of you are drinking Diet Cokes like all day long. Don't you be judging the coffee drinkers. Amen. So this is the message today. Caffeine. We're not going to talk about drugs or alcohol. Today it's caffeine. Everyone in the building who drinks caffeine, stand to your feet, come to the altars. We really don't have room for you. So just kind of up and down the aisles. <clears throat> and I'll stand up there and pray over you. Uh, we're, you know, we're, you can tell we're, we've kind of got a mess going here. But uh, it's really going to be cool when we get done. And again, I'm liking this series and I'm liking all of this uh, upheaval because it gives me the opportunity to dress like a slob. And so, you know, very rarely do I get to do this publicly. And most of you are probably ashamed right now if you brought friends. And like, I'm serious, the guy usually doesn't, he doesn't usually have so little pride. But um, he doesn't have a lot, but he usually doesn't have so little. But uh, today, it is pretty much a prideless day for me. And uh, I'm rejoicing in that, hoping that the Lord's taking note, because I don't have a lot of prideless days. Uh, but it gives me the chance to break out our new purpose statement. The mission statement has not changed. I was going to lean on that, but maybe I won't. <laughs> has not changed. It is still building friendships and finding God. But I discovered, you know, I was looking at, we, we, those of you that aren't, aren't aware of this, we, we've been operating by five E's for 15 years. And some of, you, some of you, when you were ch children, you learned the five E's. In fact, Don Prembecker, wave at me, Don. Don is probably the only guy in the room. Now, if, you're, if I'm wrong, you can correct me after church, but Don Prem is probably the only guy in the room. You have to stand up right now and say, go! And Don would be able to list off the five E's because he taught them religiously to our children. He, he did a great job, and the other teachers did as well. But Don took it to heart. Don knows the five E's. But Don's a smart guy. I'm not inferring the rest of you are not. I'm simply saying that your ability for memorization is not as strong as his. And so we have struggled over the years trying to recall the five E's. What are the five E's? Well, you know, there's, there's exalt, right? And there's educate and there's equip. What else? Can you remember what else they are? There's encourage. 
And the last one is evangelize. But the way I always remember, y'all like, he just cheated. He looked down at his notes, right? But, you know, the way we remembered the five E's was with five words that don't even have five E's in them. I remembered the five E's by worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, and evangelism. Then I would think to myself, I would hit worship, and I'd say, which one of those exalt? Yeah, that, that works, right? You know? And so when we were trying to keep things simple, clear, effective, and sustainable, it suddenly dawned on me one day, that's not very simple, clear, effective, or sustainable when none of us can remember what we're doing. And so I prayed about it, and I feel like the Lord gave me three words that better, more simply describe as a church what we're trying to do. We did not do away with the five E's. We simply compressed them into three G's. Three G's are easier than five E's. Or if you're Hispanic, in our Hispanic service right now, they are three C's. So uh, three C's or three G's, depending on where you are and what language is being spoken in your hearing, uh, they all are the same. The G's and the C's are all the same. Basically mean the same. Not the same words, but they mean the same. But we have been able to take the five E's and place them into these three G's. In fact, add a couple more to them that, that currently weren't there that, that needed to be. And unfortunately, we won't get to those today, but we will get to one of them today. But what we learned last week, we talked about that first G. And I don't know if any of you could, could uh, imagine, do you see a, the, the first G on there? You should see this. This is like a walking billboard. They had to have this shirt made at Omar's tent and on. <clears throat> so if you can't see that, I know Adam's looking at me. He's like, Pastor, you got to quit doing that to yourself. He says, you got to quit talking like yourself. I'm like, you know, I think you should be able to see the shirt. This is like two of the shirts sewn together. <laughs> gather, grow, go. Last week we hit gather. We talked about gather. And what do we do at Trinity Fellowship when we gather? It, it's pretty easy. You should already have it memorized if you were here last week. When we come to church, we come to church to do three things. If, we, if it is a Trinity Fellowship function, one of these three things, or all of these three things, or one or two of these three things, something of this is happening or else it's not a Trinity Fellowship function. We gather to worship, we gather to study the word, and we gather to do life with God's family. That's called worship, discipleship, and fellowship. All of those are found in the text that we read last week, which I'll read again to you right now. It goes like this. It's 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12b, the, set, the latter part of the verse. Set an example for other followers by what you say and do, as well as by your love, faith, and purity. And until I arrive, be sure, on, be sure to keep on reading the scriptures in worship and don't stop preaching and teaching. There you have those first Three E's in one G. You got that? Three E's in one G. But none of them are E's. They are how we remember them. Worship, fellowship, and discipleship. But there they are. And so today we're going to continue on with this text. Let's go to the next verse. We'll find the next E, which is now a G, which we remembered as an M. See how simple and clear and effective and sustainable that is? It's ministry. And here it is. In verse 14. Use the gift you were given when the prophets spoke and the, and the group of church, church leaders blessed you by, the, by their, the placing of hands on you. So verses 12 and 13 speak of the worship, discipleship, fellowship. 14 speaks to ministry. And when we gather, we gather for the reasons that we stated just a moment ago. But when, when we are here... When we are here worshiping, learning the word, doing life together, we're doing that for another purpose. We're doing that to be equipped so that we can grow in our faith and be able to share our faith. So we are growing and able to serve God. The first one is we gather to celebrate God, but the second G is we grow to serve God. We want to serve God. How are we going to serve God? We're going to grow in the gifts that he has given us. So the second one is, we want to grow so that we are able to discover, develop, 
and deploy our God-given gifts. It all makes sense. It really does. Gather to worship, fellowship, and do life together. Grow so that you can discover, develop, and deploy your God-given gifts. Everybody has God-given gifts. Now, the last word is go. We'll get to it next week. But then that's where we're going to actually move on those first two G's. And we're going to do something with that next week. Our goal here is that everyone would become equipped and prepared to use the gifts that God has given them so that they can serve Jesus and serve their church. You say, well, I'm not interested in serving my church. Well, that's your responsibility. Well, I'm not here to serve anybody. I'm just here because it's Sunday. And I'm religious. And so I have tradition. Tradition says I have to go to church on Sunday or else I feel convicted and I feel like I'm going to go to hell all week. So I only come to church on Sunday. Well, hang on. If that's how you feel, we're glad you're here. But you're really, really missing something. Paul encouraged Timothy to use the gift that he had received by the laying on of hands. I want to show you another passage of Scripture. If you go to 2 Timothy now, you were in 1 Timothy, go to 2 Timothy. Paul here talks, he carries forward this whole idea of encouragement uh, by adding instructions about how to use the gift. So 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, 7, 8. But uh, let's just look at 6 right now. It says, so I ask you to make full use of the gift that God gave you when I placed my hands on you. Use it well. Paul's instructing Timothy to use the gift that has been given him. The gift that has been given him is the same gift that's been given us overall. Anybody want to take a stab at what that might be? It is the Holy Spirit. The gift was given to Timothy. Same gift was given to Paul. Same gift is given to all of us, <clears throat> which is the power of the Holy Spirit that enables us Therefore, to move on the spiritual giftings that God has put within us. There's something about you that's different than anybody else in this building. And some of you more so than others. If you think you're the weird one, we won't look at you. <laughs> some people are very different. They just are. We like them. But they're very different. Our personalities, our dispositions... The way we're hardwired is what um, sets us apart from other people and is the way by which God, through the Holy Spirit, uses us individually. So when you say, man, I wish I had the gift like somebody else. I wish I could do what somebody else does. The reason you can't do what somebody else does is because you're not somebody else. You weren't made to be somebody else. You, weren't create, you were created to be you, and who you are and what you bring to the table is very important because you're unique and nobody else can supply to the family of God what you supply. So some people are thumbs, some people are elbows, some are knees. I heard one preacher say, I shouldn't say this. I heard one preacher, he was talking to other pastors. He was talking about the body of Christ. You know where I'm going with this. He said, when it comes to the body of Christ, he said, we need all the bodies of all the members of the body. And he said, some people are the. <laughs> he said it, only he said it. I was like, whoa. He said, some people are the arms, some of the legs, some of the head, some of the. <laughs> and I was like, I know some of them. That's amazing because that makes sense. You know, they've been a part of the church all, and I know them. Yeah. Paul uses a word here in this verse. He says, stir up the gift. You see that? He says, stir up the gift. And in our minds, we get this picture. In our culture, stirring up is... What coffee drinkers? Stirring up the coffee, right? But that's not the correct usage for stir up here. The actual word means rekindle. 
What he's telling Timothy to do is this. He's saying that there's a gift that's been placed in you by the Spirit. And what I want you to do, I want you to blow on that flame until it becomes a raging fire. I want you to stir those coals around. This is about fire, not coffee. He's saying, I want you to stir up those coals like those of you that, that have fires or fireplaces or, or burn outside. Sometimes you, you go and you stir the fire up to get that thing to burn brighter. You have to do that. So what's being said here is that there's potential in every one of us. There is a, there is a little flame in every one of us that God has put. But until we, doesn't say he will fan the flame. That's where we mess up. Some people say, I'll serve the Lord just as soon as he, right? Would, t- brother or sister, would you, would you pray about doing such and such? Just as soon as God tells me to. Don't you think that perhaps we recognize the gift in you and that's why we ask you to do that? All you need to do is stir up a gift. You don't really need to pray at all. Whew, that's some preaching right there. You don't really need to pray. We recognize a gift in you. Or we wouldn't have asked you. Do you think that our pastors or our leaders are going to come up to somebody that they know would fail in a ministry and say, Hey, would you look like an idiot for us? Would you do something for us to make us all look bad? So if we come to you and say, would you pray about doing something? That must mean that we already saw potential in you to do that. And all you need to do at that point is just begin to stir up the fire that is already in you. And it will become a flame. Paul recognized in Timothy a gift. He said, there's a gift that's been in you. It's in you. It's been in you since the time we laid hands on you and prayed. We all saw it. We all knew it. We recognize it at the moment. You're doing what you're supposed to do, Timothy, but we want you to do it to the fullest. So you're going to have to make that call because God's done what he's going to do. He's put it in you. We've recognized that. We've put you in a position to do it. But you're going to have to stir up the flame yourself. Wow. Use it fully, he said. That means stir it up. In verse 7 is the second one. We're going to use this gift three different ways. God's spirit doesn't make cowards out of us. The spirit gives us power, love, and self-control. He is saying, number one, use that gift fully. Number two, use that gift boldly. The power of God in your life will make you bold. Even if you're timid, it will make you bold in the moments that you're operating in it. You might not be bold all the time outside of that. Adam Clark, he commented on this verse years ago. I won't, I won't read you exactly the way he said, what he said, but basically he, was ta- he said when he talked about the power in this verse, he said the power in this verse is talking about uh, working miracles, to confound enemies, to support us in trials. He's saying that, that's what he's talking about when he talks about the power. And when he talks about the love, the love is enabling us to hear, believe, hope, or endure all things. And when he talks about a sound mind, it means that this is having a clear understanding, sound judgment, and I like the way he words this, complete regulation of ourselves so we think, speak, and act rightly in all things. We can operate in that confidence. We can operate in a confidence that says, I'm not bold in myself, but I'm very bold in what the Spirit has put in me and what he has taught me. I am very bold in being able to use my gift and share with you what the Holy Spirit has deposited in me. It's not me anymore. I'm bold in him, not me. And number three is the next verse, verse eight. Don't be ashamed to speak for our Lord, he said, and don't be ashamed of me just because I'm in jail for serving him. Use the power that comes from God and join with me in suffering for telling the good news. Can anybody guess how we're supposed to use the third gift? Use it unashamedly. But you have to ask yourself the question. When Paul wrote this to Timothy, why might he feel it was important to write this? Why would he think Timothy would be ashamed? Now, you need to think about this. They were living in a different culture than we are. 
And some of us have, we find persecution in our own world kind of difficult. You know, the, the Bible tells us to count the cost. And, and it's far, our persecution in the United States is far different than what people are experiencing all the rest, uh, all the, rest of the world. Ours is a little bit of ridicule and maybe you lose a little bit of business over it, you know. Other places, they're dying for doing what you're doing right now. For sitting in a room like this, they're being persecuted and some of them are losing their lives. In the day that Paul was writing this to Timothy, here's why Timothy might have been a little bit ashamed. He was not that far removed from the time Jesus had died on the cross. And Jesus died on the cross in the most humiliating fashion that a human being could die. Exposed, brutalized, in every way, tormented, crushed, demoralized, the hero of our faith, who we now, we cherish a cross. Back in their day, people were trying to avoid a cross. If they saw a cross, it might mean they was fixing to get put on it. Paul's writing to Timothy, say, hey, Timothy, stir up the gift, man. It may not be real popular. Might, it might get you in a lot of trouble. But stir it up anyway. Use it boldly and don't be ashamed. Even though Jesus died the most humiliating fashion that a human being could be known to die, even though he died that way, and he's the, the author and the finisher of our faith, even though he died that way, and even though I, the guy writing to you, am sitting in jail right now, don't be ashamed. That's, that's different, isn't it? That's a little different than the way we perceive that, the way, way we come to that scripture. We come to it with, well, it may not be popular, Timothy came to it with, wow, everybody in my culture thinks that doesn't know Jesus thinks that he was one of the worst criminals that ever lived on the planet due to the way he died. And Paul, they think the same about him because he's sitting in prison right now. And if I do what I'm called to do, I'm probably going to prison too and I might die too. Yeah, there's a cause here for Paul to say to Timothy, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of my suffering. Don't be afraid. Uh, ashamed of the fact that I'm in prison right now. I'm not here for doing a bad thing. I'm here for doing the right thing. There's a difference. Persecution was real. So if we're going to use the gifts fully, boldly, and unashamedly, we better be full of God's power. Are you prepared to use your gifts? That's the question. I'm going to ask you to answer that out loud. I want you to in internalize that and think about that in your spirit. Are we prepared to use our gifts? And if the answer to that is yes, then I want you to know that by this very purpose statement, what we're saying to you is that as a church and as a staff, we're enthused about helping you discover what those gifts are. We are prepared to help you develop those gifts. We are motivated to help you deploy those gifts. Because this is why we are here. And I want to say this to you. Nothing in life will ever satisfy you or, or excite you like operating in the gift that God has on your life. Until you do it, you've never lived. I don't care if you jump off buildings. I don't care if you uh, ride motorcycles. Or I don't care what you do. Until, until you operate in the gift of the spirit that God is putting in your life, you will never understand the excitement that comes from living for Jesus. And so we're committed to this. We're committed to growing together. We're committed to our faith. We're committed to our knowledge. And hopefully all of us in this room are, are starting to think, we're starting to focus on what, what is my gift. I want to discover that. I, I want to develop that. I want to deploy that. This is why I'm a part of the body of Christ. We are all here for a specific reason. And I'm going to say, even though some are, I don't think God intended for any to be. It's one body that doesn't need that. A spiritual body, I don't think, needs that. I know it's live stream too. I think it's important that we understand 
and correctly use our spiritual gifts. And I'm going to illustrate it with this story. Then I'm going to wrap this up. All right? All right? It's important that you understand your spiritual gift and that you use your gift correctly. Understanding and using it correctly is important. So there was an elderly lady who had three grown sons and she helped all of them uh, get through college and they became prosperous in life. And one day those three sons got together and they said, our mama, our little sweet mama is getting old. Let's all give her something very special just to tell her how much we appreciate her. And so one of them said, I'm going to buy mama a new house. He bought her a huge house, beautiful, brand new, modern house. The other one bought his mama a brand new Mercedes Benz and supplied a driver for the car. The third one had a different idea. He said, I'm going to get mama. He said, I've been looking into it. And he said, I have found this parrot that is extremely intelligent. He said, I have purchased the parrot and I have given it to this church. And he said, there's a bunch of elders down at this church. They are teaching that parrot to recite the word of God. He said, it took them 12 months, but they're almost finished. And he said, you're able at this point now, all they have to do is, is, is she simply would say to the parrot, Chapter and verse, and the parrot will, rec will recite scripture for her all day long. The other two were like, well, we can't touch that. I mean, that's big. So a couple of months goes by. And Mama, responding to her gifts, begins to send out thank you notes. And she sent one of the first one. And she said, Milton, thank you so much for the new house. But she said, it's huge. She said, I'm living in one room of it, and I have to clean the rest. George, the car is beautiful. I don't go anywhere anymore. And besides, the driver is rude. He's a pain in my rear. But she said, Donald, oh, that little chicken you sent me was delicious. Don't you think that it's important to correctly understand the gift and use it correctly as well? Hmm. Gather, grow, go. Two down, one to go next week. Remember last week we talked about the supernatural power that comes from us gathering in God's house. Anytime we gather in his house, there's a supernatural power that accompanies that and supernatural things happen. They happen when we gather to worship, when we gather to preach and to hear the word, when we gather to do life together. Those things happen. So remember that and bring people with you, right? But after we are gathered, we have a focus. And that is, we want to grow because we want to be able to be used of Jesus. And in this growth, we need to discover, develop, and deploy those God-given gifts that we all have. Because God intends all of us to be useful to the body of Christ. Some of those gifts happen in this building. Some of them happen out. Probably more of them happen out than happen in. For those of you that are worried about this message saying, wow, I, I don't know. I just, I'm not comfortable on the platform. I'm not asking you to get on a platform. You say, but when you talk about spiritual gifts, aren't you talking about singing or teaching? Or No. There's very few of us that have those gifts. Why? Because there's very few of us needed to do that. There's a lot more of us needed to do other things. And whatever it is that you enjoy doing and you're good at doing, that's where we want you to be. If you can't sing... We don't want you on holding a microphone. You know what we have to do for people that can't sing? We don't do it anymore, but I'm telling you, years ago, you know what we used to have to do? Mute their mic. I felt bad about that. I say it now because those people are all gone. Dude, 
I'd give the sound, and I'm like, dude, they're killing me. I mean, you got to mute that mic, brother. I mean, they can dance around and stuff. That's, the energy's great, but they can't sing. And I know I'm fortunate because I still get to do this, and I can't preach. I still get to every week. But I am practicing like a doctor or a lawyer. Ever thought about how weird that is that they're still practicing after all those years? I'm practicing what I do and I'm trying. We won't make you find a place that is uncomfortable for you. We weren't, we're not going to put you in a position that is going to cause you, we're not going to set you up to fail. Guess what? If you fail, we all fail. I get up tomorrow and can't find my thumbs. Uh, you say you get up and look for your thumbs? Or... No, I just take for granted that they're going to be there. When I roll in the bathroom to brush my teeth, I'm thankful that the thumb is there. I got one of those electric toothbrushes. You know what it'd be like trying to hang on to that thing without a thumb? Uh, you know, have it between two, you'd have like, what would you do? Put it, you'd have to put it between a couple of fingers, right? Yeah. You'd have to use both hands. <laughs> Nobody's asking you to be a thumb if you're an elbow. I'm going to see that going out, Ryan. I know I'm going to see it going out. People are going to go out today going. <laughs> you know, a couple of weeks, I, I got to shut up. You know, a couple of weeks ago when I preached, uh, I preached that message. And I can't even remember what the message was now, but, but, uh, I talked about uh, how that nobody ever tells me I'm pretty anymore. And um, William Reynolds, last Sunday, on his way out, he said, Pastor, great message today. And he said, and you were very pretty up there delivering that message. I was like, thanks, Will. I mean, I, I very rarely get that anymore. So I knew he was lying, and I, and I knew he absolutely didn't mean it. But because <laughs> I know Will, and I'm not attracted to him in the least way. But... I was just thankful, you know. And so today, I know when you're going out, I'm going to be seeing all this kind of stuff. And some of that's from the, some of you. You're doing that now because you're headed out behind the gym. To, to, oh. <laughs> Am I right? Uh, like, you said, you know where all the people who smoke go, don't you, Pastor? Yeah, right out behind the gym. Right on. And I'm okay with that. I'm glad they're here. Somebody say Amen. Let's gather, grow, and go. Remember this week. Pray about your gift. Pray about how you can begin using it all the ways we discussed today. Think about it. Think about it. God, what is my gift? Maybe struggling with that. God, what do I enjoy? That's the place to start right there. God, what do I enjoy? What do I like doing? What am I good at? See, that's, that's the key. That's the question right there. Whatever it is you enjoy and, you're, and that you're good at is probably what God wants to use you in. Hmm. So you think about that. Lord, how do you want to use me in the body of Christ? I'm open. I'm willing to discovering my gifts. I'm open and anxious to develop those gifts. I'm excited about deploying those gifts. In whatever way that Jesus needs me, whatever way I can serve my church, Lord, help me. Help me to have that attitude in Jesus' name. I want to ask you if everybody in the room stand to your feet. Thank all of you for your patience today and enduring whatever it is that we do. I hope, though, my whole goal today was to communicate. It wasn't to be a, the best teacher, best preacher, or any of that. It was to communicate a point to you, and that is you are special to God. You are created in His likeness with His purpose he has called you. He is, he, you were born on the day you were born. You'll die on the day you die. 
you won't even know, you didn't know either one when they were going to happen. But in the span between those times, God knew exactly when you'd be here and what you were here to do. And as a church, we want to help you be successful in operating in that place. And as I said earlier, nothing will ever excite you or cause you to feel fulfilled the way that operating in your gift will do. God doesn't make mistakes. Whatever he created, however he created you, he intended, he meant that. So Lord, I pray right now for every person in this room that your Holy Spirit begin to fall on us. On our minds, our heart, our soul. And we would begin to recognize and embrace our purpose for life our purpose for being and that we will become excited about serving you however that is whatever that looks like if it's passing out a bulletin if it's standing at a door if it's serving coffee if it's working with children whatever that might be God we are enthused to discover and it's valuable and it's needed and it's necessary Thank you for stopping by our YouTube channel to watch this video. If you want more information on future videos, all you got to do is click the subscribe button right below. If you want to give or get more info about Trinity Fellowship or all the other ministries going on here, simply go to our Facebook page at Trinity NWA or go to our website www.trinitynwa.com. Thanks for stopping in. We hope to see you right here real soon. I want to meet you.